early 1800s, they were using molasses, eucalyptus, you know, for wounds and burns and soap of honey, you know, remedies, lavender, um, certain things to soothe the skin. And then we go to um, later, like using clay from the earth or clay mass, and then the evolution of, you know, now the stuff is packaged. And they say they use it only formulas for us, you know, glycolic acid, hydrocodone, certain things for our skin. So it has been an evolution of skincare for us. The treatment and care of black skin dates back centuries from the ancient Egyptian era where Cleopatra is said to have used a combination of milk and honey as a face mask to keep her skin soft and supple. Egyptians are black people. Um, they were using clay before then, but um, as far as like those home remedies, we've always had certain things for our skin that we made work. The Yorobi people in Nigeria have a rich tradition of using shea butter and palm oil to care for their skin. While in Ghana, the Ashanti people have long relied on shea butter and coconut oil to hydrate and protect their skin from the sun. Dating back to slavery, the natural remedies of skin care was used to treat the wounds suffered by slaves from lashes and beatings by their slave owners. When they were beat as slaves, you know, for the wounds, you know, certain things like that to soothe the wounds. Um, so you wouldn't get any um, bacterial properties. So again, that would go into the tea tree root, the eucalyptus, the molasses. Molasses makes it stick and thick, so it fills the wound up, so you would heal. With our ancestral history and African roots, black people deal with many skin-related conditions, such as acne, eczema, and hyperpigmentation. Brown people, we have issues like with hyperpigmentation. A lot is like hyperpigmentation, which is discoloration. Um, I get a lot of issues and clients that come um, to me to address that. Um, other races, like Caucasians, they don't have a lot of issue with um, hyperpigmentation. So it is different formulas and different modal modalities that you use. So hyperpigmentation is like dark spots, like um, brown people, we get them like, so we get an acne or we get a scarring or something of that nature. When the sun hits it, it gets darker. So that's um, considered hyperpigmentation, and that's one of the biggest concerns um, for brown um, people that come here and they want to um, cure that hyperpigmentation. As an esthetician, Mika Mathis has been operating her own business on Capitol Hill since 2004, providing treatment solutions for black and brown people for over two decades. So we offer facials, waxing, eyelash extensions, eyebrow lamination, teeth whitening, ear candling, body contouring. Establishing her brick and mortar location right off of Capitol Hill, Skin Beauty Bar has built a faithful clientele, supporting the community with top of the line skincare treatments. Clients have to really want to support your business. What I do like about this neighborhood is that they like local owned. They don't like franchises. They like to support their local owned businesses. So that's why I've been over here since 2004. I've been located on the hill. So um, it shows that, you know, my service is great and um, that neighborhood does support um, this business. But it is still difficult because it's a black owned business. So we have higher expectations for black owned businesses to provide a more luxury service and um, go against stereotypes that are put on black owned businesses as well. After attending college, she found her passion spending time in her mother's beauty salon. I went to college and I dropped out like after my first semester and I thought I was gonna just chill at home with my mom. My mom was like, oh no, you can't stay here. And my mom had owned a beauty salon. There was a lady there that did aesthetics. Skincare. Okay. And I said, oh, she was super fly and pretty. And I was like, I'm gonna go to school for that. So I went to school that summer and went to aesthetic school and worked for a couple years. And then I went back to college and completed my education. Okay. And when I graduated from college, I still did skincare. From her humble beginnings at her mother's salon to raising her own funds to build and finance her business from the ground up, Mika Mathis is now looking to pass on her success. When I got the opportunity to get her, there wasn't no choice. I told myself, I'm gonna take custody of my daughter. It's my baby. That's what we're supposed to do as men. Take care of our home, build a foundation, you know what I'm saying? Love, our money, she's my purpose. I'm here to 
walk with her, hold her hand until she could walk alone. Ain't nothing like being a father in this world. There's a blood shortage and we came up to Death Lover's Point at midnight on Friday the 13th. Lame. Guess I'm gonna waste all this blood by dying in a predictable horror movie, way. 50% of Americans like watching blood get spilled in horror movies, but only 3% donate it. When was the last time you donated blood? Barbershop in the African American community is a staple because I mean people go through a lot of stress, a lot of hard times, and as well as happiness. Like you get kids to come through here with good grades and they want to be patted on the back. So you have to give them, you got to cheer them up as well as console when they're going through things. I boost up a lot of people's dreams around here. Just to see me come from where I came from to learning how to cut hair and actually being here every day cutting hair. With today's standards, barbers typically, they wear tennis shoes and boots, but back then, when I was getting my hair cut, the barbers wore Crocs, they wore oysters, they was top dressers, you know what I'm saying? They looked good in the community, so it was something that, that stood out about that, so that's what made me go into barbering. What, what inspired me to be a barber, one day I actually sat in here on a day off. I had an ice cream truck a long time ago. And so it was my day off. So I just sat in here one day and I looked at the people that were coming in for a certain barber. He wasn't in. And I just started calculating in my head how much money he missed in them couple of hours that he wasn't here. So I said, you know what? I'm gonna take this trade right here. I'm gonna learn it. I always looked up to Mr. Coley at Iverson Mall Barbershop. Years ago, this was when I was in maybe junior high school, and how he used to have the long lines, and like I said, the barbers used to dress back then, and Mr. Coley was one of the top barbers back then in that community. Being a, a barbershop owner promotes a lot of entrepreneurship. But not an owner, just being a barber, because each and every last one of these guys here pretty much work for themselves. So it's all in how you save your money and, and come to work. You could probably be just about, you could be an owner yourself if you save your money and do what you're supposed to do. But yeah, every last one of these guys in here had the ability, they, they really control their own business. They just under the like that brand, but they really work for themselves. We started in the summer of 92, and uh, we've been rolling for about 32 years helping the community with the football, Woodland football team. The barbershop in the black community gives out a lot of opportunities because it gives each and every one of these guys an opportunity to be their own boss, which they already are. And then it shows the kids in the community, whether you be seven up to just almost 21 years old, a chance to be a leader, uh, to grow your own business, just by watching these bottles. It, it shows young people how to work hard because when they come in here today, they know Mr. Al is here every morning around six o'clock when they ride by on a bus. And it just let them see that if I keep doing it, I can make it too. So I gotta play my part and, and just keep working hard. Man, you know, Using the straight razor in the barber shop, it was a lost art once upon a time. But when I started cutting hair, like maybe in the late 90s, I used the straight razor to make sure my, 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 my lines were precise. Because a lot of guys, they just use their clippers to make the lines precise. But the straight razor, it brings out every, it makes the definition that much finer. And uh, I think we brought the art back. The barbershop is a sanctuary because when we first opened up back in like maybe 92, 93, we had a, a lot of the older guys 
uh, come in, play checkers, chess, just to commute, drink their coffee. They didn't even um, get haircuts. They just wanted to come in and be a part of the barbershop every day, talk about politics, what's going on in the community. The significance of a haircut in this barbershop, you can have people come in, they might have just lost their job the other day. But just getting a haircut just made them feel that much better and had that much more confidence when they go on their job interview. Or, you know, just to be around other people because they down when they come in here, man. And they need an uplift. And just to, when you give them the mirror after the haircut, they feel better about themselves. Don't let the cover of your book define you. Just because of where you grew up at, or what you may look like, is not who you really are. So you go ahead, despite what you went through, and, and, and you fight for something better. Strive for something better. there are more than a dozen significant tropical and winter storms that threaten the East Coast. So chances are there will be more hurricanes and blizzards near here again. And between school, sports, and social lives, chances are you won't be with your kids when it happens. Will they know what to do? Ready.gov slash kids has all the educational tools and information to make the conversation easy. When the time comes, chances are they'll feel prepared, not scared. So talk with your family today. And someone says, you need a bone marrow transplant. Those are just not words you want to hear. I got a call that it was the best match. It was one of the best days of my life. I'm so happy that you're OK. I just want to say thank you for the second chance at life. Thousands of patients need a donor like you. Learn how you can help at bethematch.org. Um, my name is Carmen Renee. I'm the host of In a Perfect World podcast. Yeah, I would definitely say podcasts are on the rise um, because it, it combines audio and visual and it's very conversational. So it makes people feel like, you know, they're a part of the conversation. That makes people want to weigh in. So I definitely think we're going to see more podcasts in the future. I think providing that information and those experiences from current creators will open the youth's mind to um, just figuring out what they like to do and giving them something positive to do because we have a lot of you know negative activity going on so if I could just give them you know something different something entertaining I think that would um, definitely benefit the youth. We need more positivity within the community so we if we have something that's constantly telling the youth, you can do this if you put your mind to it, follow your dream, pursue your passion, it can be you, then I think that'll do wonders for our community, just having that little bit of hope. This past December, In a Perfect World was invited to the Schomburg out in Harlem, New York, to participate as a media partner for the Kwanzaa Film Festival. A lot of um, African-American filmmakers, directors, actors, just showcasing their work. And we also had a lot of um, pieces about ancestors. Also had the opportunity to be a media partner with the Congressional Black Caucus, which was amazing. We got to talk to many different African-American leaders such as Aisha Braveboy and more of her team as well. So that was exciting. So In a Perfect World is a podcast for people who have like really big dreams and we talk about their creative journey. So some obstacles you may have gone through, your I made it moment, just going over all of the feelings and actions associated with pursuing your dream. So I aspire to bring on um, just creatives and entrepreneurs. So dancers, actors, musicians, the whole nine yards. Oftentimes, the guests that I bring on, they find themselves collaborating with each other. So one guest will see that I had somebody on and they'll reach out to that person. So that way we're just networking all around, so more work. 
The good part about the guests that I bring on, they all pretty much have the same message that I do. They want to promote positivity and change within the community. So I don't censor at all. I like to give them the opportunity to say anything that they want. Um, the, you know, just giving them that platform. Um, I think that's the best way we invoke social change is by all having the same message and just working to push that because we don't have a lot of positive messages in our community today. Jason, let's go see your room. Every two minutes, a woman in the U.S. is diagnosed with breast cancer. And that's why when others look away, we lean in. We're fighting alongside patients because we know one moment can change everything. With your help, more moments of hope are possible. Join our fight. Save lives. Soul food, like I said, soul food pretty much raised us. Soul food was, it's our life, it's our, life, our lifestyle. So it's extremely important in my culture. I think it's important to the world to uh, understand what we did as, as slaves coming here and, and pretty much incorporate what we found and created into these dishes. So it's extremely important, extremely important. You said we were doing Black History Month, so I figured why not pay homage to our ancestors by doing the uh, one, the grits itself, you know, he pretty much owned the grit game. So, and then, um, you know, we gotta have collard greens. And um, of course, staple in any black household is a uh, mac and cheese, so. So I'm a no egg bacon, my macaroni and cheese. Um, I was raised that way though. My grandmother told me how to do the egg and the macaroni and cheese, which I'm not, a, I'm not knocking it per se, it's just, that's not my cup of tea when it comes to macaroni and cheese. Still good, I just prefer to do it. Your traditional, well not traditional, you're just your fancier rule way. I mean, it's, it's, it's our history. That's what they did back in the 1800s. They, they pretty much took the most simplest thing and made it into a masterpiece. That's how we came to this, to this country. I mean, we know how to turn water into wine. Greens are a staple in every black household, not even black, I think every American for the most part household. Um, so having those greens in your life with the different flavors, the textures, the different meats you want to incorporate into them, you have to have them, <laughs> you have to. But today we prepared the macaroni and cheese that has eight cheeses in it. Um, and I always do a cheese roux, a cheese sauce before we do it. So that's, I combine first my, um, I saute some shallots, I saute some fresh thyme, and I saute, I need, I need butter, so I saute that first. So I make a roux with flour, then we combine our um, liquid, which is cream and milk. I recall seeing my grandmother in the kitchen working, I mean, doing meals every day, breakfast, lunch, dinner for grandkids, her siblings. I mean, so she cooked a lot of food in her household. I mean, you have to be able to pass along your God-given talents and abilities to your heritage because it was given to you, so to do the same thing, give it back to the, to the country. I like to infuse cuisines. So, of course, the soul food is great, but I love um, Asian cuisine, I love Korean, um, but I, I love pasta too, though, Italian, so between Italian and Korean, it's probably one of my favorite ones. I look up so many chefs here locally in my own community, so we have here locally, Chef Tobias is a great, inspiration I, I look up to. Um, Chef Anthony, he's here as well. Um, we have a, it's a really close knit community we have here with chefs, so um, we all pretty much 
brainstorm ideas. We are the cuisine. I, I mean, everyone comes to us for our techniques, our different recipes. So I think we pretty much carry the word when it comes to uh, cooking for the most part. Black history is history. Black history is just, <laughs> what is what not is good about black history. I mean, of course we had the bad times of the slavery days and civil rights, but I think our culture has so much input into, into the, today's world. Um, we are still slaves though at times, but I think our history is culture. It's, it's the reason why we're here, the reason why I'm able to do what I'm doing today full time. So. Um, our history matters, and it, sh it should continue to matter. Let's get dark. We can't see the help that's all around us. Let 211 be your guiding light for help with food, health care, and other resources. 211, how can I help you? Call 211 or visit 211.org. 211, get connected, get help. Jordan knows he shouldn't eat this entire bowl of nachos, but tonight he's earned that right. Because a few hours ago in the middle of happy hour, he recognized a sign. Not from the gods or a bolt of lightning, but from a double heart, a kissy face, and a fourth ha in ha ha ha. That's when Jordan knew he was buzzed. So when it was time to go, he got a ride home instead of driving. Be a legend like Jordan. Recognize your buzzed warning signs and get a ride home. Buzz driving is drunk driving. We had a chance to sit down and talk with local baseball historian Dwayne Sims about the history of the Negro League and the roots it has right here locally in Prince George's County with the Sandlot Leagues during the early to mid 1900s. You're now talking about the, the big migration after the Civil War, which at that time, right up when you talk about that period of time, you also had people of color in Congress, in the Republican Party. So at that time, most of the migration, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., Chicago, um, Detroit, they played baseball. Even when we go back and look at the Civil War, the U.S. colored troops, even though they weren't armed with rifles and everything, they were carrying the supply carts, they would pick up a rock, stick, or whatever, and play that game. That's really the beginning of that era when we talk about sandlock baseball, which were in the communities. In these small towns, they played the game, American game of baseball. So looking at that, most of the beginning when formulation after that time, whites were running black baseball teams. Okay, they started looking at organizing because they saw there was income coming in from our communities, which means that was the biggest struggle of them not wanting us to have our own teams. So during that time, going back to Rue Foster, when he founded that league in 1920 and organized it with other owners, also you had the Eastern Colored League came behind that. You also had the Negro American League and the Negro Southern League. So they became formal major Negro League teams that people recognized. They traveled around the different cities. We live here in Prince George's County and we also had our moment in history here, Dophie Jones. He was the owner of the Washington Black Sox. They were a great semi-sandlock Negro League team. I mean, the caliber of these players, they played on par like some of the major Negro League players, believe it or not. Some of the players had opportunities actually to play for the Baltimore Elite Giants, which was one of our major Negro League teams here, and also the Washington Homestead Grays. But coming to Prince George's County, being part of that, 
Well, a lot of the players that played in our local community, you had the Glen Allen Braves, the Vista team, you had the Pomoke team down, you had several teams that played in our area. But the Sandlot, to me, is so important because this was the beginning. Most of those players played in that same sandlot, played in the community before they even saw the time to go to these large stadiums. So going back to, I've been able to meet some of the Washington Black Sox players in my time. They were honored in the District of Columbia. They were very important along with the other teams and like the Glen Arden Braves, a lot of people would know those names because of the communities that we live here in the county. But they played also games off of Mitchellville Road. One thing I don't want to miss out on is who was attending these games, even from the Sandlock League, and I mentioned Comiskey Park, where they have 50,000 people, full stadium, more people than Major League Baseball had in those days. We're talking about the 1900s all the way up to 1950, that this was the games to be seen. And to look at it, even though when you went to a white stadium, you know, they separated us. But you get down to that Sandlock League, they, what separation you talking about? People from down the road, you would, I don't think people, we didn't have the media presence, that if we actually took pictures, you would see people sitting together. With the Negro League and the Sandlock League, they were integrated. Whites played in the Negro League. They played on the teams. And you can imagine it also happened in the Sandlock League. So that's very important. People don't even realize that whites and blacks did play together in exhibition games. Everything story has a beginning. So I go back to the community when you, oh, that we're building our own communities now during the time of segregation. The buildings are going up, people are going to church. And America's game no, was played in the community. We call that the Sandlock League, but everything has a beginning. We're part of the American fabric. And now I think going forward, they do honor and actually have different events, ceremonies, recognizing the actual Negro League players. But also, I think it's also important that we share our history. There's nothing wrong with that. I think people get like, well, no, 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 no. We're capable of telling these stories. For all of life's poison risks, there's Poison Help. Poison Help is a free 24 7 hotline. Hello, Poison Help? That answers all of your poison questions. At home, I might have taken too much medication. At work, I think I've breathed in chemical fumes. And on the go, they ate a mushroom. What do I do? With expert guidance and treatment advice in over 100 languages. When poison happens, we're here for you. Just call Poison Help 1 800 222 1222. Possibilities are all around us. Everywhere we look, we see opportunity in unexpected places. And when we share our knowledge, vision, and connections, we turn great ideas into action in communities all around the world that we call home. Like transforming an old bus to feed hungry children, or providing life-saving equipment to those who need it most. From fighting disease, to rebuilding schools, together, we can make real change happen. We're Rotary. We are people of action. Get involved today at rotary.org action.